Shalom. Welcome again to Secrets of Meaning, the uh, podcast and TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, and again, if you'd like to, to make a comment for the show or suggestions or reach out, just email me at Rabbi Address at JewishSacredAging.com. Check out the website, which obviously is JewishSacredAging.com or the Facebook page and love to hear from you. We are very, very excited to welcome to uh, this today's edition of Secrets of Meeting, uh, Jonathan Branfin, who is the Eli Reinhardt Postdoc Fellow in Jewish Studies, tough to get on a t-shirt, at uh, Stanford University in beautiful Palo Alto, California. Um, welcome, Jonathan. Jonathan is the author of a very, very recently published book, you're going to love this, called Millennial Jewish Stars, subtitled Navigating Racial Antisemitism, Masculinity, and White Supremacy. It's all in one book. Jonathan, welcome. It's a real pleasure to, to uh, uh, speak with you and to meet you electronically. Uh, this book is absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I, I, can, I can see it being chopped up, pulled apart, dissected in uh, for uh, book clubs, adult education. Uh, and even if I was running a confirmation, pro this is for my colleagues, if you're running a confirmation program for teenagers and high school kids, um, you may want to think about looking at this uh, because it really speaks to a lot of what these young people, um, how they enter some of these conversations. So again, um, Millennial Jewish Stars Navigating Racial Antisemitism, Masculinity, and White Supremacy. In the part of this book, towards the end, you have this quote that this is a call, this book is a call to demystify the relationship between Jewishness, antisemitism, and race. Could you translate that into New Jersey and what does that mean? Sure, my pleasure, and thank you for having me on the show. And it's good to be electronically in New Jersey, where I grew up. Well, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, I, as you said, a big goal of the book is to demystify the relationships between Jewishness, race, and anti-Semitism. So, for example, I think many of us have heard someone say the misconception that anti-Semitism doesn't matter because Jews are white. Or conversely, maybe we've heard folks within the Jewish community say, I can't possibly have any white privilege because I'm Jewish. And these are, of course, big oversimplifications, and they also erase Jews of color, who are a big part of our community. And my hope was to take the popular media that so many of us consume already, that we're already gazing at on our screens, and use that popular media as an example to clarify how Jews with white skin and Jews of color experience both race and anti-Semitism. For example, how a Jewish person with white skin can experience white privilege in a lot of settings, but still also be a target for anti-Semitic stereotypes, including stereotypes about how Jews allegedly look. So you, the approach to this book, instead of just a, a, a whole series of charts and stuff, although the, append the back in the notes book is, is voluminous, your approach was to take a look at six stars media pop i can i can use the word pop stars i mean they're popular stars um from a specific demographic um walk with who are the six and why the six why these six sure so the six are the biracial rap superstar drake the satirical rapper little dicky who's from the philadelphia area the comedy duo Abby Jacobson and, and Alana Glazer, who created t a TV show together, uh, the comedic movie star Seth Rogen, who is really known for his man-baby roles, and uh, Zac Efron, who's also a film star, but known for his very muscular characters. And I chose those six stars because each of them really spectacularly interacts with stereotypes about how Jews look. In other words, racial stereotypes about Jewish appearance. Some of the stars really lean into these stereotypes. For example, the rapper Little Dicky self-deprecates by describing himself as a greasy, nappy-headed Jew with frail Jewish shoulders. Um, so he really leans into these stereotypes about Jewish emasculation. Conversely, stars like Drake and Zac Efron 
very vividly reverse stereotypes about how Jews allegedly look. And so, for example, Zac Efron and Seth Rogen have a couple of films together that really play humorously on the opposition between their two bodies and the image of Seth Rogen as a more stereotypically Jewish looking kind of sidekick to Zac Efron, who is presented as more stereotypically Gentile looking and masculinized. So you, you spend a lot of time, well, rabbinic hyperbole, you, had, you spend some time within the context of, of analyzing these stars and juxtaposing them to say the, the Jewish stars from my generation, okay, who presented themselves very, very differently. And just, it got me thinking to this whole arc of how media portrayed Jews from the begin, let's say the beginning of TV, and and and, I'm, and I'm, I was thinking when I was a kid, the Molly Goldberg labels for your time, of uh, you know leaning out the window from the tenement in Brooklyn to the to the Barbara Streisand, Sammy Davis Jr., you know, um, very upfront to some of the people like Kirk Douglases who who hid them, who may have hidden to to the curb your enthusiasm which was totally off the wall in many cases to this group so how, how do you how, t- talk to me about how you w- wove the fabric of this flow in the media and the presentation there's always been this tension between visibility and invisibility for jews in american pop culture because on one hand, as probably our viewers know, many Jews participated in the founding of Hollywood and the rise of movies and television. But at the same time, there's always been this fear, often well-founded, of anti-Semitic backlash. And so many people, like Kurt Douglas, have experienced the pressure to either closet their Jewishness or at least make it much less obvious. And similarly, between about 1930 and the 1990s, there were very, very few explicitly Jewish characters on American television. The exceptions would be in television or movies about specifically Jewish topics like the Holocaust or about anti-Semitism, like the movie Gentleman's Agreement. Um, And instead, often there was this practice of double coding, which means just kind of hinting that a character is Jewish through their accent or their appearance so that mainstream meaning non-Jewish audiences might not even notice and might not be alienated by that Jewish character. Um, Starting in the 90s, that erasure started to shift a little bit uh, with The Nanny and Seinfeld. But even those shows actually often avoid the words Jew and Jewish. So for example, um, even though Seinfeld and The Nanny are seen as these breakthrough shows for Jewish representation, I frequently have students who grew up watching The Nanny and did not realize that Fran Drescher's character was Jewish. They thought she was Italian. Um, Whereas this newer generation of stars who's kind of come up between the 2000s and the 2010s, they are really, really explicit about their Jewish identities in ways that would previously have been taboo. So for example, I mentioned that the rapper Little Dicky describes himself as a greasy, nappy-headed Jew. Um, Similarly, Abby Jacobson and Alona Glazer on their TV show describe themselves as Jewesses, which is, of course, an outdated and flamboyantly Jewish word for Jewish women. Um, And also a lot of these stars very provocatively address popular racial assumptions about Jewish bodies. So going back to the Little Dicky example, the way he describes himself actually with language right out of Nazi propaganda. Um, And I'm I'm not saying that all of the stars necessarily do this in ways that are constructive. However, it is a really interesting social shift to see Jewish performers not only be more explicit about their Jewishness, but to really confront audiences in provocative ways with the contradictions of Jewish racial experience. So that begs the question, why? Why now? And why these people? Why why is it okay? Is it for effect? Or is there something really deeper here? Do I I feel it? I I belong here. Both and. So there are some really positive social developments that have allowed this shift. A good rabbinic answer, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, On one hand, the effects of multiculturalism and the previous success of stars like Jerry Seinfeld and Fran Drescher 
have created more breathing room for these younger stars to be openly Jewish. There's no longer such a fear that openly Jewish characters will be unmarketable or that openly Jewish stars will be unmarketable. Another big factor is the rise of digital media like YouTube and Facebook, um, which have allowed so many people of all genders and ethnicities and sexualities to create their own homemade media and prove that it's marketable before they approach industry gatekeepers. So instead of going to a producer and being like, you know, I think a show about two Jewesses is, is going to sell really well to the mainstream. Instead, you can just make that media at home, put it on the internet, and when it gets a million views, then you can go to the producer and there's less pushback on being so open about your identity. Uh, and so, for example, Little Dicky and Abby Jacobson and Alana Glazer did come up through YouTube that way. But something else I address in the book, which is a less positive development, I think, is that frequently the stars that I chose in the book, their Jewishness is marketable, not necessarily because audiences are so excited to support Jewish representation, but because each of the stars uses stereotypes about Jewish bodies to channel wider ideological hopes and tensions about America. And I know that can sound really abstract. Is it all right if I give an example? No, no, I was going to ask you to, to, to tell me what that means. Sure. So if we go back to the example of Little Dicky, this satirical rapper who describes himself in this very caricatured way as a small, shrimpy, greasy, nappy-headed Jew. That's an image that seems so unmarketable because it, it's kind of a, it's an image that's deliberately pathetic and deliberately dirty. And it also doesn't seem to sit with the norms of the hip hop industry, which usually markets hyper masculinity. And what I found in my research is that Little Dicky's shrimpy Jewish image sells so well by offering a kind of symbol of victimhood to any white guy in America, whether Jewish or non Jewish who imagines himself as the victim of multiculturalism and feminism. So very often in Little Dickie's performances, in his videos, his shrimpy Jewish character is being overwhelmed and abused by stereotypically tough black men or by sexually overwhelming and cruel white women and women of color. And so, as I think many of us know, there are these common narratives in America which claim that white guys are now the disenfranchised victims of women and people of color and other minorities. And for anyone who feels that way, it's very easy to look at Little Dickie's emasculated Jewish character and kind of find validation in that. And unfortunately, sometimes Little Dickie's performances actually go further and offer to those viewers a fantasy of guilt-free revenge against women and men of color. So for example, there are scenes in which his emasculated Jewish characters commit assault against women or commit really gruesome violence against men of color. But it's always presented as a harmless joke because, you know, all of his videos are comedic and because he is this shrimpy little Jewish guy, or that's how he presents himself. And so for audiences who may feel a lot of these kind of racist or misogynist resentments, but who don't want to acknowledge to themselves that they feel that way, Lil Dicky's shrimpy Jewish image offers this kind of perfect avatar to feel validated in one's victimhood and to fantasize about revenge while feeling totally guiltless about it. And that's one reason why this Jewish image sells so well. One of the things that kept speaking to me as I was reading the book, and you just alluded to this, and I, I got to ask you because it's in the subtitle of the book, that is this image and the changing image of masculinity. So you touched on, on the general American culture, but... Could you talk a little bit about how your research, your your uh, your understanding? You teach you teach classes at Stanford that touch on media and Jewishness. Um, this changing focus of masculinity vis-a-vis -vis the the Jew, or I think on age twenty, you talk about the 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 um, the mythical Jew, which is another whole operation. Why, what's this focus on masculinity in the book? So usually when we talk about race in America, we're thinking about skin color. But historically, a lot of the racial stigmas about Jews actually focused on gender and sexuality. So historically in Europe, one of the ways that European society claimed that Jews were physically different from Gentiles was by accusing Jews of deviant gender and sexuality. 
such as the notion that Jewish men menstruate. Uh, and so, in particular, Jewish men were often imagined as uh, emasculated, and Jewish women were often imagined as masculinized, not necessarily in terms of external appearance, but in terms of behavior. So, for example, for a long time in European and American pop culture, there was this phrase, the beautiful Jewess. And this was kind of a stereotype in literature and art of Jewish women as externally gorgeous, but internally masculinized and dangerous. Like think of the character Judith from the Bible who seduces an enemy general only to slice his head off with a sword once he's in bed. So externally gorgeous, internally aggressive, dangerous stereotypes that are associated with masculinity. So these are really long running threads in the stigma on Jews. For example, a lot of European countries, when they were debating whether to give Jews legal equality, for example, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, part of the debate was whether Jewish men were considered masculine enough to serve in the military and therefore to receive equal standing with Gentile men. So coming out of that history, I think a lot of us are familiar with stereotypes like the nice Jewish boy or the domineering Jewish mother. These are kind of much fainter echoes of those harsher gender stigmas from the past. And so in this book, when writing about race and how Jews experience race, I wanted to make visible how these gender stereotypes are still with us and how they interact with skin color, which I know can sound abstract. But if you think about Drake, who's a black Jewish rapper, in terms of skin tone, he experiences racism as a black man uh, and he experiences stereotypes of black dangerous hypermasculinity but he also experiences stereotypes of Jewish emasculation. Like when he first got big back in 2010 and had his first interview with Katie Couric, her first question was, what's a nice Jewish boy doing in rap? So by looking at these stars, I wanted to analyze how do these stereotypes about Jewish gender interact with skin tone and help us understand what's going on in terms of race. What's been the reaction of the six stars to this? Uh, so far, there's no reaction. If anybody knows their publicist and wants to pass the book to them, by all means, please do. Um, I assume that generally uh, stars who are this large may not feel interested in reading what an academic is reading is writing about them. Um, I also, I think that many of the stars in the book might find what I wrote challenging because what I did not set out to find, but did end up finding through my research, is that just like Little Dicky, each of the stars in this book, in different ways, their performances do reinforce different kinds of racism and misogyny and sometimes anti-Semitism. And Jewish stars are not alone in this. Many stars of all backgrounds are popular because they in some way offer audiences a chance to indulge feelings that are not very pretty. Um, but I... I think that most of the stars have not done this intentionally. I think many of them, um, just like a comedian making a joke and spitballing and seeing what sticks, what gets a laugh, I think each of these stars has kind of moved towards performances that turn out to be marketable, whether or not they have consciously thought about why those performances feel so politically exciting to some audiences. So I think some of the stars, if they read this book, m might be surprised and taken aback to think about the harmful aspects of their performances. If you were Italian, could you have written a similar book selecting six stars who are of Italian heritage? And would they reinforce some of the same stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think that stars of almost any background, if you look at their performances, tend to have some effects that reinforce negative stereotypes or inequalities. Um, and so, for example, a colleague of mine, Russell Muth, has written about stars who are often celebrated as kind of progressive icons or breakthrough icons for minoritized groups. Like you, you may know Peter Dinklage, who self-identifies or has been described as the world's sexiest little person. Um, I believe he actually prefers the word dwarf. Uh, and in some ways, his appeal is that he's, you know, kind of this symbol of progress, of a better, more equal world. But at the same time, in many of his interviews, he kind of implies that all it takes to overcome 
ableism and inequality is just to kind of have a good attitude, which then allows audiences to dismiss or ignore other people who might have kind of similar challenges to Peter Dinklage, but who haven't been as lucky or as successful. Um, and so part of his appeal for some audiences may be the chance to tell oneself, I'm so progressive, I'm rooting for this person um, who's from a minoritized group, but at the same time, to feel justified in ignoring other people from that group when they speak about their challenges. So that's the type of duality that a lot of stars carry with them. You have a phrase in the book that you use a couple of times. I'm calling, going to mispronounce it, but you got to explain it to me. Okay. Subliminal postmodern minstrelsy. Yes. What is that? Uh, many people may be f- most familiar with blackface minstrelsy, like the history, the very racist history of non black performers painting right. their faces black. For example, if you've seen the jazz singer with Al Jolson. The Al, jo- the Al Jolson mentality, right. Yes. And, and, right. And there are many different types of minstrelsy. For example, there's a history of Jew face minstrelsy in America where non Jewish performers would put on exaggerated noses and curly black wigs and that kind of thing. Similarly, there's yellow face and red face. But usually we think of minstrelsy only in terms of the very blatant stuff, like the face paint. But what I found, and again, this actually was a surprise to me as I looked at these stars, is that each of them performs racial caricatures in more subtle ways, without the face paint, but with other techniques. So for example, I, I know I keep going back to Little Dicky, but he's such a vivid example. Not only does he describe himself as a greasy, nappy-headed Jew, but he visually emphasizes those stereotypes. For instance, he, in one of his first big music videos called Jewish Flow, begins the video in profile and backlit from behind so that his nose, which is naturally curved, gets outlined in white light. And the white light really highlights his curly hair as well. So without using wigs or a fake nose, he is urging the audience to pay attention to um, his kind of stereotypically Jewish traits. Um, and similarly, he has a, uh, a cartoon music video where the cartoon version of himself is very much a Jew-based caricature, this kind of racial caricature of him as a Jewish man. And in different ways, each star in the book does different types of this subtle minstrelsy. So for example, Zach Efron, I argue that he performs goy face by performing these very exaggerated white Gentile hyper-masculine characters um, in movies that are kind of very deliberately poking fun at that type of masculinity. As another example, Drake, who's a Black Jewish rapper, in some of his performances, he impersonates Latinidad. So he takes on a Latino persona, not by painting his face any different color, but for example, by uh, on Saturday Night Live, wearing a wig and using kind of facial expressions or an accent that come across as more stereotypically Dominican. So in each of these cases, the stars are are performing racial caricatures and in some cases racist caricatures, but caricatures that both they and their audiences may not even recognize as an artificial caricature at all because it is constructed through more intangible methods like lighting or body language or accent rather than face paint. So that is subliminal postmodern minstrelsy. They, do, do the kids, your students and the high school students who are going to be your students in a couple of years, when they go to these concerts and see these performers, do they understand the subliminal messages or not so subliminal messages about race, anti-Semitism, Jewish identity that they are, that, that you're writing about? I think for viewers of all ages, the pleasure of this minstrelsy is this duality of getting it and not getting it at the same time. By which I mean, what this kind of subtle minstrelsy offers for viewers of any age is the chance to indulge in racial, racist stereotypes without acknowledging that you're doing that. Um, And and for example, to gets a very problematic enjoyment out of racist caricatures of Jews or Latino people or black people, but to have the guiltless sensation of of not even really consciously knowing that's what you're doing. So for example, when Drake was on Saturday Night Live in 2014, 
he specifically had a sketch impersonating the Dominican-American baseball player, A-Rod. And he kind of does this joke interview as A-Rod about steroids. And a lot of the humor of the sketch is about this kind of racist caricature of Latino men as belligerent and not very intelligent and overly dramatic. Um, and if a white performer put on brown face paint and did that, I think most audiences would be like, oh, I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to enjoy that. that that's a problem. But when Drake does it, um, it feels subtle enough that many performer, many audiences get this kind of dual opportunity to indulge in that racist enjoyment, but not even to consciously acknowledge that's what they're doing. And that's what makes subliminal postmodern minstrelsy so marketable, the chance to have it both ways at once. Is America a racist society? I would say yes. There is certainly a great deal of racism in America. And I think one of the really challenging things for a lot of Jewish communities, and particularly for Jews with white skin, is to figure out how we name our experiences of anti-Semitism and also acknowledge our experiences of white privilege. And that balance can be really challenging, uh, particularly when we run into folks who tell us, you know, they don't think anti-Semitism exists because of, of our white skin. Uh, and my hope with this book is to help both Jews and non-Jews to better understand how race in general works in America and how race works for Jews, both with white skin and for Jews who are people of color. Um, I, I know that may be a big hope, but I, I, my hope is that in book clubs across America, including synagogue, synagogue book clubs, people can read this book and better understand their own lives. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, as I said at the beginning, uh, I think that the possibilities for congregation, just speaking from my experience in synagogue land, the, this book, and, and it's available, let's get this out of the way too, at the usual places and Amazon. And, okay, okay. Um, I, I think for some people, it, it may it may be intimidated by the book and, and intimidated by, the, by the, the title and the subtitle. But I think some people who really wanted to take a look at it in a, a, a different approach to our own youth, who are struggling. I mean, you quote a Pew study about the numbers of people who are leaving and young people who are who are gravitating away. There's nothing holding them anymore. At, look, and the, the Gaza demonstrations on campuses across the country. Many of our kids were in those tents, and, and we had colleagues who are, you know, rabbis who were leading also some of these uh, demonstrations against Israel. So the, the the world has significantly shifted. And the approach, and you speak this language of young uh, of, of students because you deal with them. I would urge our colleagues or educational directors, religious school educational directors, uh, sisterhood presidents, brotherhoods, etc., 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 to think seriously about saying, you know, this is a different approach to the use of media and how we are portrayed. And I could see a very interesting conversation intergenerationally of saying, "Tell me the, tell me the people." The, the representations of Jews in media when we grew up, you know, Port Norris complaint, you know, the Philip Roth mentality uh, to I'm in your face. I'm, I'm, I'm in your face jo and, and, and bisexual, transgender, whatever, whatever, whatever. And why and what's happening and what does that mean to Jewish identity going forward? And where's and where is that Jewish foundation of faith and spirituality that links it? I don't know. But I would imagine that, um, and in, I'm going to use the word, I'll probably get in trouble for this, an enlightened director of education could take a look at some of this and say, hmm, maybe this is an interesting way to reach those 16 and 17 year olds who are coming around. So, um, and the class you teach at Stanford, you were telling me is, is, is what? Uh, currently, I teach a class called Passing. So it's about films where characters are concealing either their Jewishness or their race or gender or social class. Um, so for example, a movie like Black Klansman, which is partially based on a true story, where you have a Jewish policeman with white skin and a black non-Jewish policeman who pass as white Christian supremacists to infiltrate a Ku Klux Klan chapter. So no, that's the type of movie that we look at. It's a tough movie. It's a tough movie. 
We also watch lighter yeah. stuff like Mrs. Doubtfire. Great movie. <laughs> Jonathan Branfin, Eli, I want to get make sure that people you get absolutely credit too to the Eli Reinhard postdoc fellow in Jewish studies at Stanford University. The book is Millennial Jewish Stars: Navigating Racial Antisemitism, uh, Masculinity, and White Supremacy. Just light and airy subjects, but in all seriousness, congratulations on this book. I, I really do hope that. The Jewish community, the organized Jewish community, organizations, synagogues can take a look at this, uh, bring you in to speak about this because it really opens up. We just touched on little things, but really opens up um, a whole menu of uh, opportunities for really important conversations and the shift in generations of how we're presented and self-perception. And especially in this thing, uh, in this day and age of anti-Semitism and, and, and racism. So I wish you health, uh, good luck, continued success. Let me know if you ever get back to uh, the sacred New Jersey. Uh, Thank you. It's, it's tough to leave Palo Alto I, and San Francisco. I, I do have to admit that. Well, thank um, you for having me. But seriously, thank you. Good luck with the book. Uh, and we appreciate your time. So all of you, thank you very, very much for joining us on today's edition of Secrets of Meeting, the podcast TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. Again, if you'd like to contact us and with comments or suggestions, just email me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. Visit the website and we appreciate your support. There's a donate button on that website. It's real easy. Just click on it, follow the directions. And uh, we're very, very grateful for you for doing this. Secrets of Meaning is produced at the studios of Lubetkin Media Companies in beautiful, as uh, Jonathan will tell you, beautiful and energized Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out to our electronic genius and supporter, Steve Lubetkin, our producer. Thank you again, Steve, for everything. To all of you, till we meet again, please stay safe, stay healthy, and most of all, in this day and age, be kind to one another. Shalom, Tudah.